Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is a continuation of our study of the book of Acts. I think this is our 10th or 11th or so video on this subject. And we started with Acts chapter 1, verse 1. We're going through it very carefully. And uh, right now we're on chapter 9, verse 6. And so we'll pick up there and see how far we get today in, in roughly 90 minutes. Um, before we get started, though, let me ask Brother Ted and Brother Joe to say hi. Uh, and you guys can decide who you want to be called on first today. I'll go ahead, brother. This is uh, Ted, and my channel is God's Truth Ministries, and uh, I've got some videos on there just giving out the great gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and how you can be saved, know it, be assured in your heart of salvation, and got some other videos on there encouraging believers uh, about who we are in Christ and our sufficiency in Christ for everything in life, so I uh, hope you'll uh, check into that and uh, Luke's and Joe's channel as well. And uh, stick around for the study in Acts today. We're, we're loving this. Hope you enjoy it too. Back to you, brother. All right. Thanks. And brother Joe? Yeah, this is uh, Joe with the Sebastian Dresden channel, a channel primarily for fellowship and uh, learning. And I do hope you'll sub if you're interested in either of those things. Uh, Christian, non-Christian, doesn't really matter. Uh, just love to, uh, to get to know people and, and discuss stuff. So... Uh, Sebastian Dresden Channel. Thanks. Um, all right, I um, I posted a second link here below, but there's no space. There. It looks like it's one long link. So yeah, the first one is the the website as a whole that has all these timelines, and the bottom part that's the link that I've chosen to refer to for um, the purpose of understanding uh, the. Uh, acts and uh, the you know the first 30 years of church history here uh, all right uh, let's oh something happened to Ted he probably clicked on one of those things and got uh, <laughs> kicked himself off accidentally are you there back with us now huh did you click on one of those uh, links and then got lost the connection yeah okay all right so if you want to you can uh, you, I hope you you save these so you can see what I'm referring to. Study it on your own too. I, I think it'll be fascinating. Uh, I'm for the audience. I'm referring to a a website I found that has um, uh, Bible timelines. Now, if you've looked at any timelines, to try to estimate the dates or of all these various uh, people and events in the Bible, um, there's a lot of them. This website I have a link here for is there's probably hundreds, hundreds, several hundreds of, of links. And of course, each one of these timelines, some authority put the timeline together, but they, all the authorities on this, they don't agree necessarily. So that if you look at one and compare it to the next, there'll be uh, sometimes uh, quite significant differences and other times uh, just very minor differences. All right, now let's get right back into this uh, study of the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 6. Um, uh, we're at the point now where um, the, the, the man uh, referred to in the Bible as Saul, Saul of Tarsus, a um, very religious uh, Jew, um, he, he is, uh, uh, he's being introduced to us here and, and he starts off as uh, a persecutor of the church, and then he meets Jesus on a, as he's going to Damascus. He's traveling to Damascus to find any of these, uh, what it says, the, the believers in the way. Before the term Christian was uh, coined, they referred to it as the way. So he's looking for all these new believers who, who are teaching that Jesus is the Messiah and He's risen from the dead, and he considers that heresy, and so he's appointed by the the Sanhedrin, which is the the, the uh, governing body of uh, of the the Jewish leaders, uh, and they uh, he, he, it's his job to round them up, imprison them, and uh, 
and it says that they are slaughtered too. So they're not only jailed, but they're being killed. So this is Saul of Tarsus, and then he meets Jesus, and he he now he's he's becoming a believer in Jesus rather than a persecutor of the church. So this is where we're picking up here, and we're, we're going to go uh, where we left off last time, starting with verse six. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, wilt thou have uh, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. All right, so verse 6 and 7. Um, which of you is going to be responding first today? Uh, I'll be glad to go first since uh, Ted did yesterday. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm noting that they, they heard the Lord but didn't see him. Uh, I can't remember if they they understood uh, what the Lord was saying to Paul or whether they didn't understand. Um, I'm assuming that the Lord probably spoke to him in Hebrew, uh, but I don't know. And, uh, and, I, and I'm uncertain. I'd, I'd have to hear what the next few verses are, whether they understood. Uh, I don't think they saw anything, if memory serves me. But uh, Saul uh, instantly knew it was, it was God, uh, although he didn't know it was Jesus, I don't think, to begin with. Uh, he knew it was a supernatural thing. And uh, Saul, being of the, the uh, Sanhedrin, uh, that would make him a Pharisee. Yeah, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? So that means he believed in spiritual things. The Sadducees did not. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. Uh, and so uh, any Sadducee wouldn't have comprehended this being God, I guess. I don't know. But Saul did. Uh, so uh, so all comes to mind. Back to you, Luke. All right, thank you. Brother Ted? Well, where we left off in verse 5 yesterday, uh, it, the, the, the question is the first thing Saul of Tarsus asked there, and uh, he says, Who art thou, Lord? And Lord, from what I understand in, in the Greek language or the Hebrew, could be you know just rendered as sir, you know, a respectful uh, 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 greeting to a, to a male, per, you know, male, uh, you know, sir, who are you, sir? But and uh, we know that the the Lord said, "I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest." It is hard for thee to get kick against the pricks. We talked yesterday about Saul was sinning against the very body of Christ. It was like sinning against uh, Jesus Himself. But look at how the words are used the same. And I'd like to uh, get with someone who or study this out to someone who knows the Greek uh, of Lord in five and six. I think. Uh, he certainly changes his tune in verse 6 because the Lord in verse 5, he didn't know who was talking to him. After Christ identifies himself in verse 6, he certainly knows who he is. And it says, and he, trembling and astonished, this is the result of who this sir is, he says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? So my takeaway from this is he knows, uh, he's just gone from greeting a sir, a voice, a male voice, uh, into saying, wow, this is the Lord. <laughs> this is not just any guy, any man's voice, any uh, authority. This is the authority. This is the Lord. And so he says, what will you have me to do? It's like total surrender. And the Lord, the Lord Jesus said unto him, arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Uh, and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no man. I mean, they, they were obviously astonished too, but this this directive was placed directly right at Saul. And uh, after Jesus identified himself, he knew that this guy was truly the Lord, the one that he must bow to. And he surrendered right away, apparently. looks looks like a change of heart, immediate belief. So back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... There's a lot of interesting things in these two verses here. Just the use of the word Lord uh, causes a lot of questions. Uh, um, 
it, it was common to refer to someone as Lord um, without thinking that you're you're calling them God. Uh, Lord is in Sarah called her husband Lord, and, and um, many people refer to as Lord, and no one is intending that they are they are actually God. Uh, but there is uh, another use of the word Lord, in which it could be uh, it's interchangeable. It's the same thing as calling them God. And in Paul's writings, uh, in his letters, uh, he uses this word a lot, and in that case. The word is capitalized, uh, Lord, capital L O R D, and the the Greek word for it is kurios, K U R I O S. I don't know that much about. I don't usually go to the Greek to study the scriptures very often, but I know that this is a distinction that's important. And so this kurios means that it's not talking about someone just giving them um, uh, and referring to them respectfully. But it's but it is in fact calling them God, and throughout all of Paul's letters, when he says Lord, uh, referring to Jesus, uh, it should be understood as he's referring to him as God. In this case, I'm looking at the KJV, and in both of these uh, verses, the, the the word Lord is capitalized. So the the uh, I don't know if it was the translators of the KJV that determine capitalization, or if it's the publishers over the centuries that have determined the capitalization. I'm, I think it's probably the translators. But the, the fact that when they, a word is capitalized like that, like Lord or the word um, word that we find in uh, the scriptures, particularly in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Um, that in that case it is capitalized and it's it's to tell us that this is a name for God. It's, it's referring to God. Uh, so uh, at this point though, Jesus, it's, I, this is the confusing thing to me. The the word Lord is capitalized and yet Paul is asking him, who are you? So I, I don't know, I mean, if you guys are good at looking up the... the uh, I could probably look this up on the uh, Bible gateway that I use here and see what the Greek word is in this case, if it's kurios or not. But uh, So he says, Who art thou, Lord? Capital L. And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who thou persecutest. Um, and then down in verse 6 it says, And he, tr and he trembling and astonished said, Lord. So it's capitalized in all three of these uh, cases here. And then a fourth time, and the Lord said unto him. So um, I don't know. If you guys are good at that, maybe you can look up and see uh, the Greek word and see if it is kurios. But what puzzles me is that uh, I don't know how we could refer to him as Lord God in verse 5 when he's asking who he is. Um, and then... Um, um, there's, there's two questions that um, uh, Saul is asking the Lord here. He first he asks him, who art thou? And then the next question in verse 6 is, what wilt thou have me to do? And <laughs> these are the two questions that a non-believer needs to address. Um, those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we understand who he is and what he expects us to do. Uh, now in this case Paul or Saul is not asking Jesus what will you have me do regarding salvation. He's just asking me more broadly, more generally, what do you want me to do? And he tells him to go wait in the city. But uh, um, when it's regarding save it, salvation, like the Philipp Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 30 and 31, the Philippian jailer is asked, what must I do to be saved? So, so the question, what do you have to do to be saved specifically, uh, the answer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In this case, he's not asking about salvation. But uh, the, the point I'm making is it's, I just find it interesting that the two questions Paul asks are the two most relevant, essential questions <laughs> that every person needs to ask. Who is Jesus and what does he expect of us? What does he require of us? Um, 
All right, any, before I go on, any more thoughts on that, guys? Well, I, I think he knew, see, uh, Paul was uh, raised uh, in a Hellenistic culture until it, in Tarsus, but his parents sent him to Jerusalem, I remember, where he became a Pharisee. So Paul believes in angels, he believes in the spiritual dimension of uh, Theophanies, and Christ, not Christophanies, but Theophanies. And when he got blown off his horse, and, and he sees this being of obvious supernatural uh, uh, continents, I think he knew right away that it was of God. I don't think there was any question that he either thought he was seeing an angel or a theophany, but he didn't know the person of Christ was that theophany or that angel, if you will, but it was obviously supernatural. And uh, the reason that I, would, I remember why I was questioning whether uh, the guys with him knew what the Lord was saying. I just remembered. Uh, because there's no mention of them being converted and following with Paul. So I'm, I'm guessing that uh, either they were Hellenistic Jews who didn't speak Hebrew, and the Lord was speaking Hebrew, or he was speaking in a way that uh, all they heard was thunder or wind or something like that because there's no record of their conversion. And had they heard what Paul heard, I guarantee you uh, they would have been mentioned as being with Paul throughout the rest of his ministry, probably. Uh, back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. Well, let me say that um, we're reading the book of Acts that was written by Luke. And this is Luke's account of this, as he was, it was probably as it was told to him by Paul. But we also get the same uh, event told by Paul himself um, later on, um, and, and they're not exactly the same. Um, in this case, it says that the, the men could hear something. They, they, no, they heard, um, but didn't, uh, let me get it, make sure I get it exactly right here. Um, it says, um, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So here it says they heard a voice. But when Paul gives his account of it, if I'm remembering correctly, it doesn't say they heard a voice. It says they heard a sound, almost like, I think it might even said thunder. Uh, it is un undistinguishable. So and I don't think these guys were... Hellenized Jews that, that were uh, didn't know Hebrew. Uh, th these were people that were accompanying Paul on a mission to seek out and arrest these people. They were there kind of like a, um, a police force supporting Paul's uh, work, ministry to catch them and bring them back and jail them. And uh, I, I think that they were probably... Uh, I would say they're probably Pharisees, but maybe a, a lesser rank than the leadership. Um, I don't, I don't know any more than that. But uh, I, I don't, I doubt very much that they were Hellenized Jews that didn't uh, speak um, Hebrew. Um, so the interesting thing is now, also regarding the, the sights and sounds here. Um, it says earlier that Paul or Saul. I should keep saying calling Saul for now. Um, it says that he. Um, suddenly, this is verse 3, suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. There is no indication, at least in this portion of scriptures, that Paul sees the, the image of Jesus, either as a vision or uh, as an actual appearance of, of, of uh, 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 the, um, the carnate, incarnate Jesus, uh, the resurrected Jesus. Now we do know that Paul is a witness of the risen Jesus, and I don't know if it's referring to right here, um, because we don't have any indication that he actually sees a person. He just there, all that's mentioned is a light. So Paul sees a light, but he can hear the voice distinctly and identify as Jesus. The the people with him, uh, they they don't see anything. It says they saw no man, uh, but they heard a voice. And, and as I said, later on, Paul gives his account of this, and it doesn't say they heard a voice, if I remember correctly, so it's just a, a rumbling sound that's indistinguishable to them. 
All right. Now let me ask Brother Ted if, uh, any more thoughts on this. Well, like you said, there are two different accounts. I know there's, uh, Paul reiterates this account, I think, in Acts 22. But, uh, you know, verse 7, it says, maybe they didn't distinguish it. It does say, the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. Now, it could be like, uh, like one of you was saying, that they were Hellenistic Jews and spoke a different language. I, w I would think, though, if they were traveling with Paul, well, since he spoke other languages, maybe they, they could have been Hellenistic Jews. Uh, but we would think that, that Christ would speak to, to Saul in Hebrew. But uh, they hear the voice in verse 7, but whether they understood it, we're not told. So it would be, it would be guesswork on my part to say. So I, I don't know. Back to you, brother. Okay, before we go on, any more uh, reaction to all that, uh, Brother Joe? Just one point, and that is I firmly am convinced that if they understood what was being said, they would have been converted just as Paul had, and uh, yet there's no further mention of them. So I, I'm assuming they didn't understand. Yeah, okay. Let's continue then here. Uh, uh, verse... Eight, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Let's just talk about that one verse, verse 8. Go ahead. Well, this is uh, what some people think is the thorn of the flesh. Uh, now, Bill has a good teaching uh, that's otherwise. Uh, but I think the, the common uh, belief in the majority church uh, holds to uh, Paul Paul's thorn in the flesh as a continuation of his blindness, although it says later he, his sight is regained. Uh, they maintain that because of some verses where it says Paul signs his name in very large letters and such uh, that, that he probably maintained a, a, a loss of vision to some degree. Uh, but uh, I don't know. And, and it doesn't say anything about any communication between Paul and his, the people who were burying him to Damascus. Uh, so that's all I get from that verse. All right, Brother Ted. Well, yeah, obviously uh, he's there. He's without sight. You know, I know you're going to get into that three days and three nights, but um, uh, I know Joe touched on uh, what some people believe is the thorn in the flesh. We're never told, and I'm, I'm kind of glad that we're not told in Scripture what that thorn in the flesh is. That's another subject altogether, but I know that some people tie this verse into this when he, he was blinded. But, um, you know, I, I like how it says there, he uh, arose from the earth. Uh, and, you know, in our vernacular, we just say, man, he, he got up off the ground. I mean, you talk about being floored or being grounded. Uh, this was it. This was truly uh, Christ uh, showing his uh, superiority, his authority, and, uh, you know, his, you know, the, the Bible, you know, in a lot of ways, we, we're in the age of grace where we love grace and all, but the Bible in a lot of ways, uh, when someone's rebelling against God uh, or is an unbeliever, a, a blatant, shameless unbeliever like Paul was, zealous in his unbelief, uh, and, you know, when someone sees that about themselves, as Paul and Saul did here, later to become Paul, you know, the, some people can, as an unbeliever, I can understand how they look at the Bible as a very condemning book, you know, condemnatory in a category, if you want to say it that way. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. All one has to do is ask what Saul said here, you know, who are you? You know, who is this person, Jesus, like Jesus asked him? Who do you say that I am? And uh, the other good question is, like you put it, Luke, you know, what? How did you say it? What's expected of me? What do I need to do? So, uh, Paul was certainly put in his place here and literally, literally floored <laughs> uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Back to you, brother. Yeah, yeah. I like how you said that. Literally floored. Uh, well, let me. Take a stab at this verse here. Um, it says, when he arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, 
So that makes me wonder if this entire time, if his eyes had been closed. Um, maybe because the light was bright, immediately he closed his eyes as a defense from the brightness of the light. And, and he could see it with his eyes closed, which would be more of a, even though it's a real appearance, uh, it, it would be more like uh, seeing it without your eyes. Uh, I don't know. I'm just uh, speculating on that. Um, but um, the idea about the damage to his eyes, I, I think he was uh, completely healed. Uh, I think when, I think it's Ananias is the guy's name, uh, if I remember right, uh, that Jesus sends to him. There are several Ananiases, uh, but uh, uh, when, he, when he comes and heals Paul's eyes, uh, I think his eyes are healed. I don't think he's like healed and left with some kind of eye damage. Um, however, I do think that over the years, because many years transpire from this, <laughs> this road to Damascus and Paul's death in Rome, uh, if we look at the timeline, um, the death in Rome, I think, is supposed to be about 68. And, and this um, timeline here, let me see. It's, um, uh, we're in chapter 9, Paul. This is supposed to take place between like 34 and 37 AD, this Acts chapter 9. So let's say this is like 35 AD. And so around 68 AD, he's executed. So there's many years for Paul to get old. And it's just very common for people to uh, <laughs> get older and your eyes go get bad. So I, I, to me, that's a more logical explanation of his, his eyesight. And now, as far as this being a, his thorn in the flesh that uh, is referred to uh, in one of Paul's letters, um, I've heard a whole bunch of different theories on what this is. And most people think that it is some kind of a physical problem like eyesight or a bad back or whatever, uh, whatever it was, he had health issues. Um, and a lot of people think that because Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, um, and he traveled with Paul for many of these years, he was his main travel, one of the main travel commands. Of course, Paul traveled with, with Barnabas and then later on with Silas, but Luke was there. And, but Luke was also a physician. And it's, uh, it, many people think that the reason Luke had to be with him all the time is because he was a physician and he was there to, <laughs> certainly, certainly we know Paul needed a physician because of all the beatings <laughs> and, ish, and physical um, um, issues he had from, from the being uh, punished. He was beaten with clubs, I think three times, beaten 39 lashes with a whip four times. Uh, stoned and left for dead, snake bitten, all these things. So you can see why Luke would come in handy being a physician. But getting to the question of the thorn in the flesh, uh, for, for many years I thought it was either some physical ailment like the eyesight, or many people think that it's a demon, he's under demonic attack. Uh, but recently, Brother Bill explained his his interpretation of that and I'm convinced he's right and I, when I was told it to brother Joe I think he was he, he, he was impressed with it but I, when I told it to brother Ted he was not surprised he was familiar with this he had heard a, another famous theologian who will go unnamed um, but he heard it from him and so Bill this is not a unique idea from brother Bill and that the idea is basically if you read the uh, thorn in the flesh uh, verse, and then you back up about 20 verses and start reading it all in context, the conclusion that I, I come to now is that the thorn in the flesh is an archaic saying for, like, uh, it's a pain in my ass. Like, oh, man, you know that guy that keeps on following me around and harassing me everywhere I go, and I, I create a church, and he comes and follows me up, and he's trying to spoil all my work by teaching them they got to follow Judaism, these darn Judaizers. He's a pain in my ass. That's how I, we would say it today. 
So if you read it in context, I think that's the proper understanding of it as, as I see it now. Um, all right, before we go on, that's one verse. There's an awful lot to be said in that one verse there, but um, you guys, any more thoughts on that? Uh, no, no further thoughts, really. I will add that while I do think uh, that, that what you said just now uh, is the correct interpretation for years, uh, I thought, and maybe it's my own issues, but I thought it was a, a, a spirit of lust that, that, that bothered Paul, or pride, one of the two, because of how he buffeted his back, and he actually beat himself, flagellate his own body, because he, he was so sick of his flesh, and uh, so uh, that's another theory that's out there, and that's the only other thought I had. Uh, well, when we... Uh I don't think the reference to him flagellating himself is in Acts. It's in one of those letters. I don't remember where. But I think if we were to study that, uh, I think that is to be taken metaphorically. But I'd have to look at that more carefully and look at it. I, I don't think he was literally beating himself. Uh, but I don't want to argue that because I'm not really so confident in that. Uh, all right. Um, um, but it could be the argument about pride that's very easy to understand because it, the, the, the Lord says, you, you know, he, he's, you've asked me three times and I'm telling you no, and it, it's to keep you humble. And it, so people would think, well, Paul would, has a tendency to be arrogant and proud because he's so knowledgeable, smart, and, and so in this way God is, is giving this issue in, in order to humble him. Uh, so that's a, a logical assumption there. Be before we go on any further, uh, Brother Ted, what are your final thoughts on this? Well, two things. Uh, first of all, I I definitely think the, the reference in, uh, I think it's Philippians, where Paul says, I, I buffet my body, or maybe it's uh, Corinthians, I buffet my body to keep it in subjection. I, I definitely think that's metaphorically, because uh, uh, other places Paul says our body is the temple of the Lord. I, I definitely don't think Paul would do that. I think that's metaphorically saying he just, uh, you know, uh, did that to keep his keep himself in subjection to Christ. Uh, and I am I'm glad that we're not a hundred percent sure what the thorn in the flesh is, um, because uh, uh, then we would think our problem is worse. You know. <laughs> So I'm glad we don't know 100%. I think we can draw some conclusions that that the messenger of Satan, you know, the thorn in the flesh was a, a Judaizer. You know, I'm I'm more prone to believe that. But I'm I'm in a sense, in the ultimate sense, I'm glad. In the final analysis, we don't know what it is because uh, we all have our own. So back to you, brother. Yeah, yeah. I know you said that a couple of times now. I'm I can see a point, but for me, I'm. Uh, if I could understand every verse in the Bible perfectly, I'd, I'd accept it. I'd love to, to know that. I don't. I'd like to not have any verse where I'm unsure of the, the meaning of it. But uh, all right, uh, I'm going to go on. Verse um, uh, verse nine. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Uh, and there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord, and that's also capital L. Uh, and the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and enter uh, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen a vision, um, hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. I'll stop at verse 12 here. Brother Joe? Well, I, I think it's neat that, uh, that Paul being with, or Saul being without his sight saw a vision of the man that would come in and lay hands on him and, and heal him uh, so that's fascinating to me uh, I also uh, am stuck and I'm sorry uh, that I have to go back to what something Ted said uh, you know I don't think that we're meant to understand everything 
for instance, the, the doctrine of salvation is clear to anyone who looks. Uh, but a lot of things, I think God does leave vaguity for his own purposes. Uh, uh, and uh, we are required to search, study, and show ourselves approved. So I think that uh, that uh, God does, God could could have made everything as as clear as salvation, but uh, He chose to leave uh, a lot of vaguity in a lot of areas uh, for us. And I think there's a purpose in that, uh, and maybe it's just because He wants us to have this discussion. But uh, that's all I have. Back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I've uh, thought a lot about that in the past. Why can't everything be so crystal clear in the Bible? And there's so much confusion that people have in arguing about the meanings of things. Uh, and uh, but I, I agree with you. I think that it's it's just there for for those of us who have a, a great desire to understand the scriptures. Is we we make an effort. And 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 you know what? The things I don't understand when I finally get it. Uh, it's it's a, it's a great joy when when I there is a revelation or an epiphany. It's just, epiphany. It's just a God, it's it's so exciting to especially if something that you either misunderstood and now you see it correctly, or something that hey you just read over it and didn't see any any significance and all of a sudden you read it or a brother explains something to you and you say wow. It's so profound, and I had no idea. I just skipped right over that. That's an exciting thing, and that's one of the reasons I do these studies with you guys is the joy of learning and understanding the scriptures. I, I, I forgot to turn my camera on for all that. I, that wasn't even my turn. I'm sorry, Brother Ted. Yeah, it's all good, Brother. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead with verse 9 through 12, if that's okay, like you said. Um, the first thing that jumps out, of course, is verse 9. I mean, where it says, Saul, uh, and he was three days without sight. I mean, that's bad enough. But it says, and neither did he eat nor drink. I mean, I mean, isn't it true that after, after three days without water, I know you can't live uh, up to more than five to seven days, I thought, without water, but I mean... I mean, uh, I wonder how close Saul was to, to being almost dead uh, after three days without water. I can see three days without food. We, you know, you can fast that way. But uh, anyways, going on in verse 10, I'll just throw that out there for you guys. Verse 10, uh, the disciple at Damascus, Ananias, the Lord calls to him. And uh, I like how in verse 11 and 12, he just get, starts giving out directives, directions, uh, orders <laughs> to Ananias, go, you know, go into the street, which is called Straight, Straight Street over there, inquire in the house of Judas, okay, got that, a guy named Judas, and uh, a guy named Saul, okay, and then this, this Saul that I'm talking about there, that's in Judas's house, his name, he's from Tarsus, <laughs> and this guy's praying, can you imagine what Ananias is thinking, this is the great persecutor of, of the body of Christ, uh, and God tells him, this is where you're going to go. You're going to go into the house where he's at, right into the very room. And uh, this guy's had a vision of a guy with your name, <laughs> Ananias. You're going to come into the bedroom there where he's at, and you're going to put his, his, uh, your hand on him so that he can receive his sight. Well, Lord, you know, is that so he can see to hit us better or what? <laughs> he doesn't tell Ananias, that he's a chosen disciple of mine, a chosen vessel of mine, until he gets to verse 15. So, uh, you know Ananias is a disciple and trust the Lord, but I just think it's kind of funny if we read between the lines there. Uh, back to you guys. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, and you guys were very thorough on that, so I don't need to say anything. I'll just move on here. Of course, the next verse is the Ananias' uh, reaction to all this. Uh, Verse 13, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's the reaction you're referring to. That's the, that's the logical reaction based upon what he knows, uh, of course. 
he didn't just accept the fact that the Lord was told him to do something. He's kind of questioning it and challenging it. Um, I'll read verse 15 too, if you then get your thoughts on all of it. But, but the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. <laughs> okay. All right, Brother Joe. Well, uh, two things come to mind. Number one, uh, Paul's companions are no longer in the story. Uh, so I've got to assume they're hightailing it back to the high council to uh, inform the Sanhedrin uh, what's just happened to their uh, their their main guy, you know, the, one of the Sanhedrin himself. And uh, they're going to be perplexed because I'm pretty sure the servants don't know, or his co uh, Sanhedrin or co workers are going to be at a loss of exactly what to say. They just helped this guy to Damascus, and now they're no longer mentioned. So I know they're on their way back to Jerusalem. And uh, the debate or the, the discussion, I would love to be a fly on the wall. Uh, and then I, I'm noticing how cool it is that uh, God doesn't just issue directives to uh, robots. Uh, you know, uh, so often uh, people who say they are against Christianity say, well, I don't want to just, you know, be a mind numb robot and do, you know, everything. He was actually engaged in conversation with God Almighty. You know what I mean? He's like, but Lord, this doesn't make sense to me. And and God wasn't condemning of him, rather explanative to him. And uh, I, sh I see great mercy and, and, uh, and, and the ability for a man to actually uh, have communion in, a, in a, a conversational way with God Almighty, which is really radical if you think about it. Those are my two thoughts. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brother Ted? Yeah, great thoughts, Joe. Uh, uh, before I get into the text here, I, you know, it's good. A uh, the, the couple other examples come to my mind about people that, you know, you could kind of say argued with God. One was Moses when... Uh, you know, uh, uh, the Lord told him from the burning bush, uh, you know, you're going to go and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Um, you know, Moses argued with him and said, no, you know, you've got the wrong guy. Basically, I can't even talk right. I can't even speak good. My speech is bad. Uh, you know, <laughs> and the other wasn't it uh, Lot who argued with God. It's like, well, you know, don't destroy it for 50. Don't destroy Sodom for 50 righteous people. Don't, and then, well, well, how about 40, 30? 2010, you know, so um, God isn't afraid of an argument. He, he's never going to lose an argument, but uh, it's, Joe, you just make me think there that God's not afraid of one. He's, he's open to dialogue as long as it's uh, sincere. That's a good point, brother, you brought out there. Um, but uh, where were we? Uh, uh, verse 14, 15, uh, you know, we have Ananias's uh, fear. He's, he's got some intrepidation there, obviously about going to this guy named Saul of Tarsus. Uh, it'd be like telling the scrawniest kid on the block to uh, uh, go uh, into uh, pray for the biggest bully on the street that's picked on you and all your friends for, for a couple of years and uh, go pray for him in the hospital so he can see better now. You know, And you think, well, see better to what? Hit me and mistreat us all again? <laughs> but the Lord just says, look, show out, go thy way. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name, to, the, to bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I, I, I thought, guys, we had talked on this before in another study, but uh, the order of the words used here, bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, and I personally, you know, I will show him how great things, how many things he must suffer for my sake. I don't know if you guys want to get into this, but... Uh, you know, this is God himself, the Lord Jesus, foretelling what's going to happen to Paul. He's going to suffer great things, but he's going to suffer as a vessel of mine. And, uh, wow, that, there's a lot there, guys. Um, maybe we should talk about that and whether there's any need for the order of, of, you know, the way God said Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. If that's important, that order, I don't know. I just want to throw that out to you guys and the suffering aspect. Uh, back to you. 
Hmm. Well, first let me uh, speak to Brother Joe's uh, theory that the uh, Paul's companions uh, are, I guess, I, I do think it's correct to describe them as like the police force um, that that Paul has taken with him. He's like the sheriff and he has all of his officers there. And um, um, these people, did they did they leave, or as as you speculate, Joe, or did, were they there? I don't know for sure. I, all I know, I did see a movie. And I don't know how they're basing their conclusion, but in the movie, his companions were still there in the room when Ananias came and healed him. Uh, but that doesn't prove anything. <laughs> but that's the only thing I've ever seen represented about these people. Uh, uh, but regarding the um, uh, the, the uh, brother brother Ted, the the example you gave for Lot was actually Abraham. And I was thinking about that before you went into Moses and and the uh, uh, bargaining with God from with Abraham. Uh, I was thinking of the same thing. I didn't really recall Abra Moses, but I, I was thinking, wow, yeah, this, this Ananias. Uh, I can you can understand him bringing up his concern to God, and he wasn't afraid to do it. He was a God, but it's, it's like God, God, aren't you aware that this is the guy that that's creating all these problems for your saints in Jerusalem and now he's come here to, to take us and imprison us? Aren't, he's informing God like he doesn't think God's aware of it. Uh, so that was interesting, uh, but it also came to my mind that the nerve of Abraham actually negotiating with God for uh, him to be, be merciful on Sodom if there were just so many good people there. and. Uh, um, now, the last point I think you made, let me see if I can remember that by uh, reading this. Uh, uh, oh yeah, the order of the, uh, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings of, and the children of Israel in the suffering. Well, as far as the order, I know you brought this up a previous study that there is something you think is significant there, but if, if to me it's not even the proper order um, because he always preaches to the Jews first um, every even when he went to a new city he, it was his custom to go to the synagogues first go through the scriptures show how the prophecies uh, talked about this Messiah suffering and dying and resurrection and saying they see it's, that was Jesus so that was he went to the J Jews first not the Gentiles and the kings um, so I don't really see the, any significance in the order that you see there, uh, but suffering from my namesake, could, uh, could you imagine? Let's say that somebody wants to sell you something, and they, 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 they want to convince you to join a cause or something. They want to tell you all the good reasons you should join a cause, but God sells points to, to uh, Saul. It's not, oh, you're going to be blessed and you're going to be admired throughout history and and uh, you're going to have all these uh, treasures in heaven. <laughs> he decides to tell him all the ways he's going to suffer because he's now becoming an apostle. Uh, that that is that's pretty amazing to me. It's not really the kind of thing that seemed like God would want to want to tell him to to initially win him over and convince him, hey, <laughs> this is really good. <laughs> All right, I won't, before I go any further, any more thoughts? Yeah, uh, several. Uh, first of all, uh, going back to, your, to, to the one point about uh, uh, discussing conversationally with God Almighty. Uh, you know, if, I, I just remembered that during the time of Paul, during this very season right now, Caligula was the emperor of Rome. And uh, there was a big to-do because Caligula, during Paul's lifetime, was trying to get his bust put into the Jewish temple. And it was driving him nuts that he couldn't get his bust put into the Jewish temple. And, uh, and it was almost coming down to the point where he was going to just, you know, slaughter everybody so that he could get Caligula's bust into the temple. Now, I say that because of this. If Caligula said to one of his servants, do this. 
and the servant would say, uh, you know, Emperor, I, I, I see what you're saying here, but look, he'd be dead before he finished his sentence. And, and that's true of just about any great leader. Uh, in, you know, even Patton, if a soldier questioned what he said, you're done, court-martial, you know, you're going to have problems. Uh, I don't think the angels ever question God at all. When he says do something, I don't think there's the discussion back and forth. But with mankind, we have such a special relationship with the creator of the universe uh, that we actually, he will actually tolerate and even enjoy or entertain our questioning of his authority is amazing to me. You can, you can only wonder what the angels are thinking. Oh my gosh, this piece of clay is arguing with the creator of the universe. God Almighty. It just shows what a special relationship we are in with God. As to uh, the second point is Ted's thing of the order of events uh, to the Gentiles and then the kings. and the, I think I disagree a little bit with you, Luke, here. I think it's highly significant. Uh, I think way, way significant. Now, Paul, has a, it, he's not the first minister to uh, go to the Gentiles, but his station or his cast is is unique among all the apostles as the apostle to the Gentiles. And so I think the order of those uh, mentioned there by God to begin with is highly significant in my mind, go, showing Paul his special direction. Not to say he doesn't go to the temple wherever he goes first, but his emphasis is starts with the Gentiles, and that's a unique thing amongst the apostles. And uh, the last thing I wanted to, to say uh, I, I, is has slipped my mind. Uh, yeah, nuts. It was a, it was kind of important, uh, but uh, that's all that comes to mind right now. Back to you. All right. So you're going to think of that last thing as Ted's talking, and when you do, make a little note on your notepad there, so when Ted's done, you don't forget it again. Okay. But Ted, I'm particularly interested in your um, explanation of the, the significance of the order, because I know you, you do see a significance. So tell me about that, please. Well, I don't know if I know the significance. I just think there is a significance. I'm claiming, what I'm claiming is, is that the, there's a significance. I just don't know what it is. If I could guess, which uh, I think God will let me do since he lets uh, people argue with him, uh, I think the significance is is like that's the first when 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 uh, the Lord is is making this uh, statement, and he's gonna he's saying to Ananias he is a chosen vessel to me, for me the Lord Jesus Christ, he's gonna bear my name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the first group of people that he mentions to Ananias a Jewish disciple who's going to go to this bully, no longer bully, but uh, he says, listen, he's going to bear my name before the Gentiles, guy, and, and to kings and to the children of Israel. I mean, can you imagine when the first thing that, uh, that Ananias heard, he's going to bear my name to the nations, you know, and that means the nations that are, that are not of Israel, the nations. Sometimes we just think Gentile, Gentile, Gentile. Well, Really, that word Gentile just means the nations, you know, outside of Israel. So, uh, non-Jews. Um, so, I'm saying there's a significance. I just don't know what it is yet. Maybe we'll figure it out later in Acts. Uh, but it is significant that Paul is the only apostle, getting back to what Joe said, he's the only apostle that identifies himself, I am the apostle to the Gentiles, in a couple of his epistles. Maybe more than twice he says that. So, I don't know yet. Back to you. Hmm. Yeah, well, I find it interesting that um, at this point uh, in the timeline, there's only two people that become aware that Gentiles are going to be included. Paul's told initially by, by Jesus, I think that was in, the, didn't he say that in his initial conversation? Let me look back. Um, 
if you if you guys are no, speak up and interrupt me. But I'm looking for the idea is in the initial speech did he say anything about he was going to be the to the Gentiles? Well, Paul, so Paul's aware of this, and um, and now Ananias becomes aware. The Lord tells Ananias, Paul is going to be this preach to the Gentiles. And I'm wondering, yet, yeah, yeah, and Ananias must be really surprised because, as we've said so many times, um, nobody has a clue that Gentiles will ever be included in any way with the, the uh, Israel, the Jews. Or, can, I, and, can I interrupt, Luke? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yes. Uh, Ananias is the first person in the entire Word of God that realizes that the Gentiles are to uh, come into the body. And uh, Peter said it. But he never comprehended it. Remember, he said it, but obviously he didn't comprehend it because it doesn't really illuminate itself till Cor uh, Cornelius. Now Paul hasn't talked to Ananias yet, and he knows someone's coming to heal him and all that, but he doesn't know anything about this Gentile stuff. And I just looked over the portion where he appeared to Paul or Saul. Nothing was said about the Gentiles. It was why do you persecute my people, which. Paul or Saul would have thought of the, as the Jews. So actually, the first person in the entire Bible to realize that God intends to save the Gentiles in the same way as the Jews is this guy that's going to see Paul. And I, I just now realize that. He's the very first person in the Bible to realize it. Hmm. you got to add something, brother. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I looked in Acts 22, where Paul reiterates the, his conversion experience, and I looked in Acts 26, and Acts 26 has something that chapter 9 and chapter 22 doesn't have. And if I could just direct you guys to Acts 26, starting in verse 14, and I think he's uh, Paul is before King Agrippa here, Talks in verse 13 about midday, a light from heaven that was brighter than the brightness of the sun. Verse 13, etc., etc. Verse 14, and when we were all fallen to the earth, so apparently, not apparently, obviously, even the guys with him fell to the ground. When we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue. So there's our answer, Joe, about whether he was speaking to him in Hebrew or not. There's our answer right there. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But arise, but rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which, in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, Wow, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So he told Paul uh, in the Damascus Road experience that he was going to deliver him from the people, obviously the people of Israel, uh, and from the Gentiles, whom I now send thee. So even though Paul always went to the Jew first, he had the directive on the Damascus Road, as we get later, uh, that he was also going to be sending him to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light. So there we go. Neat catch. Neat catch, Ted. That's neat. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'm glad you went there. Uh, I, I, I said earlier that the account of this uh, Damascus experience for Paul, um, the account given by Luke and Acts is not exactly the same as Paul's account when he writes it in his, uh, or, or later on, when Paul's given the account uh, in his own words. Uh, there, are other, there are details that are left out, like I think it also discusses, as I said earlier, that the in this account we just read, it says that they heard a voice but I think in Paul's account, it says they heard like a sound of thunder. And so there are some differences um, in that idea that uh, Paul was aware that he was going to be preaching to the Gentiles. Uh, I thought that that was made known to him initially from Jesus, uh, but 
it just wasn't it wasn't uh, included in Luke's account. So that's why that's why we have these things called the Gospel according to Matthew, the Gospel according to uh, Mark, the Gospel according to Luke, the Gospel according to John. It's not that the, they're disagreeing at all. It's just that they're they're giving their own account in in their words, led by the Holy Spirit, and covering the things that um, maybe someone else left out, but they're covering it. And so that it, when you read it all in its totality, you get everything. But if you read any one account of any of these things, then you're not going to get the entirety of of it all. So, all right. Um, before we go on, any more thoughts? No, just that that was an awesome catch by Ted. Uh, that answered a couple of questions that were really bugging me, so that was neat. All right, very good. So let me continue on. Um, <clears throat> verse 16 says, uh, He must suffer for my name's sake. In verse 17, And Ananias, Ananias <clears throat> went his way, and it entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. All right. Your thoughts on that? Well, uh, what an awesome moment. Uh, I, I see that you don't have to be an apostle to lay hands on somebody and uh, have miraculous things happen again. Uh, I see that uh, Cornelius, uh, or not Ananias, uh, got some bravery uh, about him. I mean, he must have you know, obviously from his conversation with God, uh, had some reservations, like, like Ted said, at least some reservations. And, uh, and I thought of what I was going to say last time, and, and maybe this is pertinent. You know, if God has shown us what we, the troubles we would go through with, by accepting the gospel and believing on him, a lot of people uh, would be freaked out. You know, I'm thinking of the 21 people that were just beheaded in Syria who uh, refused to renounce Christ. Uh, what if God had told them, you know, in about seven years, uh, some people are going to cut your heads off and, and slaughter your families uh, if you, you know, get saved and you accept and believe on me. And, uh, you know, what, what, if, what would we do if we knew it was God's will that we marry a certain person, but we... Also, we're told, oh, and by the way, uh, this person's going to have an affair on you, or this person's going to have a child that's going to be horribly deformed, or, uh, you know, this person is going to die in a car accident three years into your, your uh, wedded bliss. You know, all these things, we would just be unable to function, I think. But Paul, he's revealing what's going to happen to him as a result of his conversion. And uh, I find that to be fascinating, both as to God's reasoning and to his mercy that he doesn't do that to anybody else that I know of. Back to you, Luke. All right. Thanks. Brother Ted? Yeah, good, uh, good catch as well, uh, Brother, about uh, someone other than the apostles laying hands on people here in the book of Acts. And... Uh, them uh, and and the person they laid hands on received the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's that's interesting, and I notice how when Luke read that he he read uh, with with emphasis he really enunciated brother Saul. <laughs> so uh, in between the Lord's initial commanding of Ananias to go uh, see Saul of Tarsus and lay hands on him, he obviously was convinced in his heart that this guy uh, is a brother in Christ, although. We know from other places in scriptures that the Hebrews uh, called each other brethren. I mean, when Peter started his uh, sermon on the day of Pentecost, you know, men and brethren, uh, you know, obviously 3,000 that weren't converted yet until Peter finished his sermon. So it was common in the Hebrew culture and still is today, from what I understand, for 
for Jews to call each other brother, and we know that's uh, also used in other cultures. Um, but uh, uh, I think verse eight, verse eighteen, uh, is pretty cool. I, uh, I I like I like some of the weird stuff in the Bible because you know it's just stuff the Lord doesn't leave out. And you know, as a kid, I was into the the old monster movies and horror movies, and I just I just think it's funny that. Uh, you know, the, the weirdness of stuff that's in the Bible, like, you know, how God doesn't leave anything out. Uh, and there fell from his eyes something uh, as if it had been scales, you know, weird. I just think of, like, fish scales or something, you know, falling from his eyes, and I just think that's weird and cool at the same time. And he received his sight, and then he arose and was baptized immediately. So, uh, you know, good stuff there. Sorry for my weirdness, but I just like that. Back to you. Man, Brother Ted's so weird. Man. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, uh, let me read it and get see what I think of this. Uh, well, the use of the word brother, I, you're right, I, I emphasize that intentionally because I, I take that to mean that he recognized Saul as a, as a believer. Uh, now, the word brother, or, I'm not sure I, would, I can think of any time the word brother is used for Jewish people calling each other brother. I do know the, the word brethren, which is another form of the word. Uh, so brethren, it's, it's speaking to as as a group of people that they're they, they're part of the brethren uh, in that they're all Jewish people, uh, and it is important. There is there is uh, some confusion at some points in the scriptures where people see the word brethren and think that it's talking about church when it's really talking about Jewish people, and so I, I don't think of an example immediately, uh, but. Uh, there is a distinction between the brethren, which are the, the, the Jews, uh, call it referring to each other in that way, and, and uh, the Christian believers. Um, now, the, the scales from the eyes, um, I don't know. Uh, I looked at the Amplified to see if it was expressed in any other way, and it's the same. It says immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Um, so I don't really know more about how to take that scale, unless it's I I I, I think it's uh, was portrayed in movies that his eyes were like crusted over, like if you know you know if you get sleep in your eyes that stuff that accumulates in your eyes from sleeping and and, and I, I can imagine it like that. But a large amount just covering his eyes, and, and um, that's just how I imagine it. I think maybe I've seen it in movies portrayed that way. Uh, but then here's a um, important point: says that might and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, Jesus uh, appeared unto thee in in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, um, there's a difference between filling and baptism of the Spirit and indwelling in the Spirit and sealing of the Spirit. I talked about this many times, these four different things. Uh, uh, filling, I think, is um, that God's going to give him power now to do the mission. The Holy Spirit is going to empower you. Uh, and, and and now and immediately he arose and was baptized. Now I've I've kind of made a rule that uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't use the word baptized uh, to in thinking it's automatically immersion in water, um, unless the the verses around it tell us that hey there was a river they went into the river or you know, if you don't have the word water or the context clearly tells you that it's water, we shouldn't just automatically assume that it's a water baptism. <clears throat> uh, 
many times it's just bat baptized just means that they uh, they believed and were baptized. It means that they, by believing, the Holy Spirit came into them. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, the scriptures uh, calls it that. But um, in this case, it very, it very well may be water baptism, but on the other hand, uh, uh, I, it doesn't say any, any more about they went outside and they and they went found a pond or uh, or even even if it was just sprinkling because sometimes baptism was pouring of water. Uh, and I, I think in the in the in the Bible it's it's uh, it used as immersion, but you know as the church went along they considered it pouring. I talked about Irenaeus's book last time about. Uh, on heresies and how they were arguing about the proper baptism, but in this case, uh, unless unless they poured water on him or they had a tub or something and submerged him, and I don't know, I really don't know if it, I, I'm inclined to believe that he got water baptized, uh, but then then some people would think that see water baptism is required, and we've discussed this at length before. No, it's not required, but. It's a symbolic uh, ceremonial thing that we should all do, so that we're uh, we're saying, look, I'm not ashamed. I'm, I want everybody to know I believe in Jesus, and this is a symbolic ceremony, and it's an honor to be able to do this publicly, so that everybody else can know that I believe in His death, burial, and resurrection. Um, all right, any more before we go on? Yeah, I would say, brother, when we get to Acts 22. Uh, and Paul's other recounting of this uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, I think, of the uh, council there that he's before, uh, Acts 22, I think we're going to get confirmation that it is water baptism. I know we don't have to get into that right now, but uh, that Ananias did indeed baptize him in water. So back to you, brother. All right. Thank you. Okay. Let me read further then. Uh, um, verse 19 and when he had received meat he was strengthened then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God um, I guess I'll read 21 too but all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? So that's through verse 21. Brother Joe? Yeah, it seems as though uh, uh, Paul is stepping into the shoes of Stephen. Uh, just mind-boggling. I mean, really. I mean, can you imagine the the Sanhedrin? And and, the, and I might add that the the high priests at the time were Sadducees, and and they were uh, the Pharisees' arch enemies. So uh, there was no love loss between Saul and the high priest anyway. But uh, here he is actually taking Stephen's place. Just mind boggling. Back to you, Luke. Yeah. All right, Brother Ted. Well, the thing is, uh, the thing that strikes me is, you know, he ate some food and was strengthened, and he was with, uh, he was there several days, it says certain days, but I think the, the translation, probably better in some of the other translations, uh, several days, with the disciples, which were at Damascus, so he didn't just stay, uh, hold up, obviously Ananias and uh, the house of uh, Judas uh, there, on Straight Street had some had some visitors and uh, Paul was saw obviously was fellowshipping and with uh, with the disciples the disciples of Christ there for several days at Damascus uh, and then verse 20 is just uh, you know and you know in verse 19 he's reiterating his story you know he's loving telling the story of, of his conversion and what happened and they're all just amazed and confirming hey this guy's for real you know this guy's a, you know, he's. They were convinced he wasn't just pulling the wool over their eyes in order to have them all uh, bound in chains and take them back to uh, to uh, Tarsus and so forth. No, this guy was uh, 
affirming his faith in Christ, obviously, and his, his encounter with the living Christ, the resurrected Christ. But verse 20, immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Wow, what a verse. One sentence. One sentence, just bang. Straightway, that's the old English, immediately, he proclaimed, he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. I, that probably went over like a lead balloon, and we'll see that it did in most places. But, uh, uh, you know, carry on, brother, because we're going to see what happens. And this is basically the theme of Paul's life from here on out, what's happening. Uh, the Jews don't receive him for the most part, uh, but Gentiles start do receiving him. Uh, the Jewish leadership collectively doesn't receive Christ and the message Paul goes to them with all the time in the synagogues first, to the Jew first. But some, uh, an elect or a minute, a minute few do, and then it seems like majority Gentile. I think that's going to be the theme that we're going to see from this verse forward. Uh, carry on, brother. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, part of the recurring message I want to keep repeating uh, is kind of a a cause that I've taken up uh, be, be, because I, I resent the the false teaching of the Paul only -ists. so I, I find myself constantly seeing things that that they would grab a hold of and, and I need to address them um, but you see right here Paul is preaching in the synagogues at this point he's he's not preaching to any Gentiles uh, we're going to find that the first case that is decided of an actual preaching to Gentiles will be Peter to Cornelius, and that's coming up in chapter 10, I think. But uh, uh, Paul is still is preaching to the Jews, still, even though he was aware, and Ananias now aware, that the Gentiles are going to be preached to and included, uh, he's still initially preaching to the Jews in the synagogues. And what does he preach? Uh, that he's the Son of God. Now, here's another problem. The Paul only say, see? He's not preaching the death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel is not being preached yet. He's preaching the, the Jewish message of the kingdom, you know, that the, the Messiah is coming, the Son of God. And all that. There's no death. Just because it says he's preached that he's the Son of God doesn't mean that you think that he walked, got up before the synagogue, stood up and said, Jesus is the Son of God, and he walked out. I think he had a pretty lengthy sermon, like Peter's sermon. You know, this is the promised one. You killed him. And he goes through the scriptures. It says in other places that it was um, Paul's custom to go to, the, go to the synagogues first, go through all the scriptures and show that all the things that were written about Jesus. So this is what he did. He talked all about Jesus, that he, that showing the Old Testament prophecies about him and the fact that he, he, he has come, but you killed him. And he, but he died for our sins, and he's raised from the dead, and we're, there's eyewitnesses, and now I've seen him. This is the message, and he's the Son of God. It, his message was not only that he's the Son of God, and this is what Apollonius would try to draw a distinction here, saying that, see, the gospel's not being preached yet. You're not going to find that until you get to 1 Corinthians 15, or no, in Acts 16, 31, you can finally get that. Uh, but uh, they still think that a period of time goes on before the, Paul even gets it right. There are people that, that we would uh, could be classified as not just Paul onlyist or hyper dispensationalist. There are people that take up such an extreme. They're called ultra dispensationalists, and they say Paul wasn't even tr preaching the true gospel until the end of his life when in prison. They say that it, it was. It, when he was in prison, his prison letters, that's the time he got revealed the true uh, true gospel message. That's how far that they take this. So, um, just another thing for me to get upset about. Um, so, um, now, we'll cover one more point, and then we'll, I know we got to cut it to 4 o'clock sharp for Ted to go. Uh, uh, verse, uh, where is it? Oh, verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? 
But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dealt, dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that, many days were filled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying a weight was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. We'll stop at verse 24 um, uh, for today and pick up here. Uh, 9. 25 is where we'll pick up. Okay, so um, go ahead, brother. Give me your thoughts on that. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, because we've got nine, eight minutes left in the in the broadcast, and we have to get the gospel out. I want to make this my summary, uh, without even uh, touching the last verse written. Uh, I haven't gone off the path and down rabbit holes uh, for quite a while, so I want to do this now before I forget. Years ago. Uh, I was thinking about how Paul never really forgave himself. Uh, you know, all through his letters, he's everyone else forgave Paul. There was there's no mention of any any brother that that didn't forgive Paul or held his past against him. But Paul was always had that in the forefront of his mind. So I'm not sure God forgave him, but I'm not sure he ever really fully forgave himself. But I, I just what I want to mention is 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 the epiphany I had several years ago is the greater the sinner, the greater the potential saint. And I think Paul is an excellent example of that. And uh, and as I look back over my life, uh, the greatest, Christ said, who, for, who loves more, the one forgiven much or the one forgiven little? And then he answered it for them and said, the one forgiven much. And and I think that uh, one thing I want to get out in the, the book of Acts before, we, before I forget is that the greater the sinner, the greater the potential saint. And Paul is a prime example of this. In my life, the best Christians I've ever known are the ones that have come out of homosexuality or rampant drug abuse or, or uh, prostitution. And and uh, and I just think Paul is an excellent example of uh, when we, we say, oh, I'm not going to bother witnessing to this person. She's a prostitute. Or I'm, I'm telling you, when, when someone is a great sinner and they receive Christ, they have the potential to be the greatest among the saints. And that's all I want to say back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've talked many times about uh, a dramatically changed life is, is a great part of a, a great testimony, uh, even though some people are truly Christians and you don't see a change. So it's not required, but when it, it does happen, it does say a lot. Uh, go ahead, Brother Ted. Yeah, amen, and we can, we can just... Uh, finish up right there. I, I want to say amen to that. And uh, obviously, Paul had uh, had great humility, uh, you know, in the midst of his zeal. But like Joe said, he probably got that humility by realizing how, how you know, he even said in some places, you know, the grace of God was exceedingly abundantly, uh, you know, towards me. Speaking about himself, and uh, he, he just realized how how much. Uh, a persecutor of, of Christ's body, he was a persecutor of the Christians, and obviously was truly humbled about it when he thought about it, and uh, it carried uh, carried over into his uh, Christian walk in in a in a good way, in, in that humility that he had, uh, uh, knowing what he came from to what Christ made him into. So, uh, back to you, brother. Good study. Thank you. Uh, okay, a few thoughts on these verses before I we close here. The Verse 20 says, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. Uh, now there is going to come a time where you see he, he goes, I think, 14 years uh, off in Damascus. And, and, and uh, there's a 14-year period where you don't hear anything about what he's doing. Uh, but here, there's no delay. There's no time to study. or, or It's just immediately. Straightway, immediately, he goes right out and starts telling the Jews in the synagogue because he now he saw the light. Literally, you know, there was a great light on the road to Damascus, and now he, he's uh, you know compelled to tell the Jews about it. Um, but uh, he's got to realize that how they're going to react because if if someone ever a Christian came up and preached the gospel to him. Imagine, imagine with him and his and his uh, little uh, 
a policeman. He has a company, and and, and uh, they're there, and someone comes up and starts preaching the gospel to everybody. Uh, they're going to be arrested and jailed, and as it says, they're slaughtered. This is the word that was used. So Paul, you know, he knows this is this is the official position of the Jewish, I believe, religious um, leadership that they we ground them up, imprison them, slaughter them, and so Paul was very much aware of what he was getting into, and he didn't hesitate. Um, and then, of course, immediately they turned on him. Of course, they would. They, they were all gone. Hurrah! Saul, go get those, go get those um, heretics, and they're all rooting for him. And then all of a sudden, he's converted, and now immediately they turn on him and are plotting to kill him. It takes about that long for them to decide they're going to kill Paul. Or actually, he still calls Saul. And that gets us to the question about his name, Saul and Paul. Well, maybe we can remember to discuss that next time. But uh, let me finish now just a minute telling people the good news. that uh, When I say the good news, that's, that's the literal translation for the word gospel. So I want to share the gospel, uh, which means I want to tell you the good news. The good news is that uh, if you have a desire to go to heaven, uh, then... then uh, Jesus actually will give you eternal life in heaven. Now, the Bible calls heaven, says that the heavens and earth are going to be destroyed, and there's going to be new heavens and new earth. Everything could be perfect, better than ever, and, and we get to live in the new heavens and new earth, and we get to live there with perfect bodies that never grow old or sick, or there's no more tears. It's just going to be perfect. And Jesus is offering you to that right now as a gift. Now, a gift means that uh, you don't have to work for it and earn it. That's what religions teach. That to go to heaven, you've got to really work work at it really hard. Join the religion. Uh, yeah, you got to change your life. Follow a strict set of religious rules, and if you do well enough, you'll earn heaven. Uh, but because it's a gift, you don't work for it. You just accept the gift. Uh, uh, but, but someone did do the work. Jesus did the work. The Bible says he lived a perfect, sinless life, and, and we couldn't do that. All of us have sinned to certain extents, but the perfect life Jesus lived, the Bible says we get credit for it. It's imputed to us. Uh, the perfect perfection of Jesus is placed on us. And, and at the cross, when Jesus was crucified, our sins were placed on him. So he paid for your sins, and he gives you credit for his perfect life, and that's that's the kind of the, the transaction. When you believe in Jesus, this this is what happens. You're you're considered righteous. You could never be considered righteous in the sight of God, but through your own efforts. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. No matter how hard we work at it, we're going to fall short. But you can be considered righteous because of your faith in Jesus. Uh, now, uh, he, did, he didn't die and stay in the tomb. On the third day, he was raised to life bodily, and that bodily resurrection is the sign that he promised to, uh, to, so that we could have confidence in him. That we, it was the proof that his, his claims were true. What did he claim? He claimed he's God himself. He claimed he came down from heaven to give his life as a ransom. And he paid for our sins. He claimed he would raise himself from the dead to prove that he is God and Savior. And he is the sole source of life everlasting. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus claimed that he is the sole and exclusive source of life everlasting in heaven. Now the question is, will you believe him? Uh, if you This message, if you believe it, you receive it. If, as soon as you believe that salvation is offered you as a free gift from Jesus, you receive it at the moment you believe it. I hope you believe it now. If you do, <laughs> then just as a Ananias said, Brother Saul, as soon as you believe this good news, then we can call you brother and sister. All right, brothers, uh, Joe and Brother Ted, thanks again for participating, and uh, um, hopefully we'll do this again tomorrow, every day possible, and uh, 
bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.